Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I, uh, last night was a great night. I'm actually really surprised to see so many enthusiastic faces in the audience. Um, I want to start off by profoundly thanking the organizers of the meeting uh, for giving me the, the first talk on a Friday morning after the conference dinner. Thanks. <laughs> really appreciate, appreciate that, Phil and, uh, and Tim. <laughs> um, I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about about organic phosphorus in tropical forests, and particularly how, how phosphorus cycling influences uh, the ecology uh, of tropical forests. Um, but I'm also, uh, will spend a few minutes at, at Phil's request uh, at the end of the talk, giving some, a, a few minutes of reflections, which everybody seems to be doing here. So uh, I'll, I'll also do that for the last few minutes. So about 20 minutes of, of organic phosphorus, and then about five minutes of, of some thoughts on, uh, on organic phosphorus, and, and in particular, this meeting. So some of you may recognize uh, this place from the last organic phosphorus meeting. This is Barra Colorado Island in Panama. You can see our, our lab facilities there where we had the, uh, the second part of the, of the meeting. This is the Panama Canal running through uh, the top of the image. The boats go through from the Pacific side on the right of the image up to the Caribbean and out uh, through the locks on the, on the top there. And this is one of our primary research sites in, in Panama. And we have, a, we have a plot on, on the island here. This is an island in the middle of, a, of the canal. We have a plot, a forest plot. It's one of these big, large-scale forest dynamics plots, one kilometer wide by half a kilometer uh, north-south. And the, what we do in this plot is measure all the trees every, every five years. And there are 300,000 trees in this, in this plot. This is trees bigger than one centimeter diameter. And in this plot, with these 300,000 trees, there are actually 300 species, 300 tree species. And so this is, uh, uh, I think, highlights one of the real challenges that, that I face uh, in trying to understand phosphorus in the environment, is this, is this diversity uh, in tropical forests. And actually, Panama is not that diverse as a tropical forest. Um, here's two examples of other plots uh, that we have in, uh, in the Amazon and in, uh, in, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, where there are more than 1,000 species of trees. Uh, in, the, in the case of Yasuni National Park in the Amazon there, this is in 25 hectares. And so effectively, we've got the entire temperate tree flora, the equivalent diversity, in the, in the size of a few football fields in these forests. Now, when we compare that to equivalent plots, in, uh, in this case in, uh, uh, in the USA, at Wabicon Lake in Wisconsin and Santa Cruz in the Redwood Forest in California, two plots about the same size, 40 species and, and 30 species. And so you can see this massive difference. This is not to pick on the, on the Americans, by the way. I, mean, not, I don't want to say anything negative about their diversity. I mean, this is very typical of, of temperate forests around the world. But it just, I want, <laughs> there's more American jokes coming up, don't worry. This is just to illustrate this real challenge that, that we're facing in, in, uh, in studying tropical forests. And so I want to quickly highlight the three Questions that, key questions that, uh, that we address in my, my institute in Panama relating to this diversity. First of all, why are tropical forests so diverse? How can we explain this incredible diversity of, of trees and how can, how can this diversity be maintained over the long term? Why do one or two species not come to dominate like they do in temperate forests? We're also very interested in distribution patterns uh, what factors are controlling the distribution of tree species and how does this contribute to, uh, type, to diversity in these forests? And thirdly, we're very interested in primary productivity. This is becoming more and more emphasized as, uh, as, as global change modelers try to bring tropical forests and phosphorus cycling into the, into the Earth system models to constrain predictions about future climate. So we're very interested in what's controlling the growth of tropical trees and in particular how this will change in the future. And so, as a, as a, a soil scientist, perhaps I'd call myself, working in, in, in Panama, these are the, the questions that I try to bring a soils perspective to. And I'm, uh, in my talk, I'm going to deal a little bit with each one of these and, and try and explain how I think that organic phosphorus is, is contributing to, to answering these questions. <clears throat> now, we've seen a few versions of this, uh, of this figure, the classic Walker and size. Uh, model of phosphorus transformations uh, during pedogenesis. This is, this is uh, uh, 
Uh, another version, I think this is the prettiest version, it's got nicer colours uh, than the ones we saw earlier in the week. But the point I want to make with this, uh, with this model is that in old soils, uh, the soils on the, uh, on the right of this diagram, uh, the phosphorus is dominated by, by organic phosphorus and by residual phosphorus or phosphorus occluded within, within secondary minerals. And so we're, uh, we think, of course, that because most of the soils, many soils in tropical forests are, are old, they're strongly weathered, they've not been glaciated for, for perhaps millions and millions of years, uh, that organic phosphorus is a, is a key uh, component of, of the phosphorus cycle and, and making phosphorus available uh, to organisms. And I know there are many of you in the audience who like to see a good soil pit, a nice soil profile, and there's one of my favourites. Many, many of you visited this actual profile. I have a very good photo of Phil Haygarth in this, in this soil pit from the last meeting. It's, uh, it's on the top of, uh, of the research island. It's an oxysol. It's a, a candiudelphic eutrodox, if you're into the, uh, the US taxonomy nomenclature. Uh, it's uh, very strongly weathered. It's formed in andesite. You can see it's... Uh, full of iron oxides, phosphorus is very strongly retained in, in this soil, uh, and we think that uh, for plants growing on this, uh, on this particular soil, that organic phosphorus turnover is very, is very important. But of course, not all tropical forest soils are old and strongly weathered. Uh, here's a, a selection of some soils from our research plots around the world, the oxisol in Panama in the top left, um, but we've also got alphasols, uh, ultisols, many in Southeast Asia, entosols in Malaysia, even mollusols, the soils of the, of, the, of the northern prairies, we find them occasionally under lowland tropical forests, in this case in, in Thailand. And so a real diversity of soils, a real diversity of, of, of phosphorus concentrations and phosphorus availabilities. Now I want to, uh, I want to spend a few minutes talking about some, some data from Panama. There's the Republic of Panama. Uh, I'm going to particularly focus on this area around the Panama Canal. For the Americans in the audience, Panama's just, just here at the bottom of, uh, of, of North America. Um, so the, pa the Panama Canal, I'll show you on the next image. So I'm going to zoom in on this square here. So the Panama Canal, here's Panama City uh, in the bottom right of the image. This is the Pacific Ocean. Now the canal works through two sets of locks into Gatun Lake. There's Barra Colorado Island in the middle. And then the locks, goes off, the, the locks go off into the, into the Caribbean. And what you can see, I hope, from this image is a legacy of the, uh, of the old canal zone, which was a 10-mile wide strip around the canal, a protected area around the canal. And what you can see is that the, the, the legacy of the canal, if you like, is a beautiful swathe of protected uh, lowland tropical forest going all the way across this, only 50 miles across this, uh, across this image here uh, from the Pacific to the Caribbean. Now, there's two, two um, for me, from my point of view, there are two very... Um, important features of this, uh, of this canal area. One is that there's a very strong rainfall gradient uh, from the Pacific coast here, uh, less than, uh, less than 2,000 millimetres on the, on the Pacific side, down to about 1,600 millimetres. And then just 50 miles away on the Caribbean, we get more than 4,000 millimetres of rain, so a very strong rainfall gradient uh, across, this, across the canal area. But it's also very geologically complicated in this region. And... Uh, the result of that is that we have a huge, a huge variation in soil properties, and I put some of the, some of the key properties there on the right. pH varies enormously. Uh, most important for me and for us here today is, is the variation in phosphorus, a huge variation in total phosphorus, and particularly in, in plant-available phosphorus. This is a resin uh, extractable phosphorus measurement there, um, several hundred-fold variation in, in, in plant-available inorganic phosphorus across, across this gradient. And so what we can do with this gradient is we can start to uh, to, to look at these two axes of variation, the moisture gradient and the phosphorus gradient, and start to, to understand something about how uh, soils, and in particular phosphorus, are influencing these many, many hundreds of species uh, in these forests. So just some, some quick data on, just to demonstrate the variation in, in organic phosphorus that we have in these soils. This is a selection of soils actually only from Barra Colorado Island, so this 1800 hectare island in the middle of the canal, and I hope you can see very clearly that there's enormous variation at a very small spatial scale in, in total organic phosphorus. These are depth profiles uh, down to, down to uh, 1.6 metres uh, in the profiles, and I think you can see a huge, a huge variation uh, in, in soil organic phosphorus. Now, one of the interesting things about the organic phosphorus in most of these sites is that we find very little 
Um, phytate. We've heard lots about phytate this week. Um, we tend to think of phytate being stabilized very strongly in, uh, in iron-rich soils, in, in, in soils that have a high phosphorus fixation capacity. And for example, there's a temperate pasture soil, an, an NMR spectrum uh, of a temperate pasture soil, and you can see the phosphate signal there, but also a series of, of inositol phosphate peaks, the Skylo, the four signals from Myo, IP6, and also uh, uh, Neo and d Cairo uh, inositol phosphates on the, on the left, and so full of inositol phosphates. If we look at a typical soil from Panama, um, what I hope you can see quite clearly is that we don't find any inositol hexakis phosphate. The soils, the organic phosphorus is dominated by these phospholipid degradation products and some, and some mononucleotides. So we're not finding inositol phosphates uh, in these soils, which I've attributed so far to the fact that they're very, very phosphorus. Phosphorus is very, really in demand in these soils, so you favor microorganisms which have the, the enzymes and perhaps the organic acid solubilization capacity to degrade these compounds like phytate, which otherwise would be very strongly bound in the soil. And just very briefly, we also find major changes seasonally uh, in these soils. This is some data from a fertilization experiment where we add uh, nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium uh, to big plots, 40 meter square, 40 meter by 40 meter plots in the forest. And so I'm just showing here on the left, soil organic phosphorus, uh, uh, minus phosphorus, so in no phosphorus treatments, and then plus phosphorus treatments. Uh, you can see that the phosphorus, the organic phosphorus increases by about 50% when we, when we raise the phosphorus status of, of the soil. Uh, but on the right-hand panel, you can see for the two treatments, um, the seasonal pattern of organic phosphorus. Now, we have a very strong dry season of about four months in Panama between January uh, and, and April, uh, which, is, which is here. And you can see a very strong decline in organic phosphorus in these soils during this time period. And there's also a, a parallel decline in carbon uh, and nitrogen in the organic matter fraction. And it turns out that we can explain this, this variation in, in organic phosphorus, this seasonal pattern, uh, through the changes, parallel changes in the microbial biomass. And so the bottom figure is microbial phosphorus, uh, determined by, uh, by the hexanol fumigation method. You can see there's a, there's a response of the microbial biomass to phosphorus addition, but also a very strong seasonal pattern in the microbial phosphorus uh, pool. And quantitatively, it almost perfectly explains uh, this variation in soil organic phosphorus. And in fact, it turns out that a major component of the organic phosphorus in these soils is actually in the microbial biomass. And I saw a, a couple of examples of our, our work from New Zealand earlier in the week where we, where we put together these stocks, and this is the parallel uh, the uh, stocks for this tropical forest in Panama. We've got inorganic phosphorus in the soil in the blue. Uh, this is mainly residual uh, secondary mineral uh, phosphate. The organic phosphorus is in the kind of orangey-brown color. Uh, the microbial phosphorus is the red box and the, uh, the, the vegetation phosphorus. The phosphorus in this luxurious tropical rainforest is in the green box. And the point I want to make here is that actually that microbial phosphorus pool accounts for more than 70% of the biological, the biological phosphorus in this forest. So if you add up the plant and the, micro, the soil microbial phosphorus, more than two-thirds of it is actually in the, the microbial biomass. And that really tells us something about plant microbe competition for phosphorus and who's in charge, who's in charge of the phosphorus cycle in these forests. Now I want to, uh, for a few minutes, address this issue of, of how how soils and phosphorus and organic phosphorus acquisition influences uh, the diversity and distribution uh, of plants in these forests. And so there's that same canal area that I showed earlier, and all the little dots there are different plots. We have a whole series of one hectare uh, plots and also some bigger plots in, in this canal area spread out on different geologies and across this very strong rainfall gradient. And by looking at the plant community composition in these plots, we can start to tease apart the effects of moisture and soils. And we've known for a, a quite a long time that the moisture gradient, the rainfall gradient, has a, a very strong influence on species distributions in the, in the canal area. And so I'm showing an example here for one species. This is uh, Xylopia macrantha. It's in the, in the, uh, the custard apple family. Uh, and what I hope you can see is on the, on the top panel, where the shaded circles occur, this is where this species is present. And the open circles are where this species is absent. And so what we can see quite clearly from this is that this species only occurs on the wetter 
uh, side of the isthmus, and it's absent completely from the dry side of the isthmus. And so this species is a, is a, is a drought-sensitive uh, a drought sensitive species and you can see in the 50 hectare plot here this is on Borough Colorado Island a kilometer by half a kilometer each of those dots is a the presence of this an individual of this species and what you can see is it occurs predominantly on the on the on the slopes on the plot which we typically uh, associate with more wetter sites in the dry season so an example of a very uh, a drought sensitive species in the in the canal area and this is work that Bettina Engelbrecht did many many years ago we know very well that moisture is very important. What we've not understood is how important soils are in affecting these distributions, particularly phosphorus. And so I'm just putting up three examples here, three different species with contrasting affiliations to phosphorus. So what I've got on the, on the x-axis in each of these cases is this measure of resin phosphate. Uh, um, and on the, on the y-axis is the probability um, that these individual, these three different species will occur in a plot. And so if you look at the top plot, this is for Cavanalesia a platanifolia. This is an iconic Panama, uh, well, Central American emergent, uh, emergent tree, which I'll show you a, a picture of in a minute, a really impressive uh, species. Um, it's always been considered to be very drought sensitive and its distribution driven by drought. But what you can see, I hope, is that on the uh, left side of this image, uh, left side of the graph at low phosphorus, this species never occurs. The probability of it occurring at a site is zero, effectively. And as, as phosphorus increases, as we move towards the right, and the probability of finding cavernalesia in a plot increases to, uh, to almost 100%. So at high phosphorus, you can basically guarantee you'll find cavernalesia platanifolia. And so by taking the, the regression model uh, plotted, plotted here in the, the black line, we, we get the, the first order parameter, which we call the effect size. So this indicates the strength of the, of the association of this species to phosphorus. And in the case of cavernalesia, it's plus two. Uh, that indicates a strong association with phosphorus. The second species is Eschwellera pitierii. This is a common species all across the Amazon uh, and it's uh, very strongly associated with low phosphorus. So you can see the opposite pattern to Cavanalesia. At low phosphorus we can almost guarantee we'll find uh, Eschwellera. At high phosphorus uh, Eschwellera is absent. So that means that Eschwellera has a, a negative uh, phosphorus effect size, minus two, indicating a very strong negative association with phosphorus. And the third species is, is, a, is actually a legume. It's actually a nitrogen-fixing uh, tree, Ingevera. Um, Ingevera shows basically no relationship to phosphorus. It doesn't care. It occurs at low phosphorus, high phosphorus. And actually, it has a very strong moisture association. And so it, can, it only occurs at, uh, at high moisture, and, but doesn't really care about phosphorus. And so its phosphorus effect size is, is close to zero. And we'd say that that species has, is a general, a, perhaps a phosphorus generalist. There's Cavanalesia, Platanifolia. It's not in the Bombacaceae anymore. They changed the, the family. Um, but nevertheless, there's a great example of, uh, of this tree species. And what you can see on the right here um, is uh, uh, the banks, are a place the, uh, around the Panama Canal. And what, what we're looking at here is a fault uh, going up through the landscape. On the, on the left-hand side, we have basalt, very low phosphorus soils, absolutely no Cavanalesia. On the right, we can see marine sedimentary soils, high phosphorus, and covered in this deciduous um, Cavanalesia platanifolia. So a real clear example of the, the power of the soil, the power of phosphorus in this case, to, uh, to determine the distribution of, of some of these species. And we can produce these effect sizes for moisture and for phosphorus for many, many species, for more than 500 species that occur in our plots. And so here's a, uh, um, a graph where I've plotted the, the phosphorus effect size on the, on, the, on the right, on the left, sorry, and the moisture effect size on the right. So effectively, these two axes of variation are partitioning the distribution of, of more than 500 species in the canal area, and we can assign very precisely the, the relationship with each species to phosphorus. Now, we're fairly certain that organic phosphorus and the acquisition of organic phosphorus is a, is a really key trait in determining these distributions. Um, here's some data on phosphatase activity in the soil. So this is a general uh, soil phosphatase assay uh, on the, on the, uh, on the y-axis, phosphomonoesterase and diesterase in more than 80 of these plots in the canal area are plotted against resin phosphorus. And what you can see is an exponential increase in phosphatase activity um, around two parts per million of resin phosphorus. So as soon as we get below two parts per million resin phosphorus, which I, I realize is incredibly low compared to some of the numbers that we've heard of, talked about this week, uh, in agricultural systems, as soon as we get below two parts per million, there's an enormous upregulation of investment in phosphatase activity in these soils, in bo both monoesterase and diesterase. 
And when we look at the tree community composition, what I've done here is plotted those species with very low phosphorus affinity, the ones that only occur at low phosphorus, they're the blue circles, and the high phosphorus affinity species, the red circles, the, one that o- the ones that only occur at high phosphorus. And the point where the proportion of the community shifts between the high phosphorus and low phosphorus species also is about two parts per million resin phosphorus. So we have this congruence between the, the phosphatase activity data demonstrating investment in organic phosphorus and also the community uh, of trees that are inhabiting these sites. So it seems like we have this strong strengthening phosphorus limitation or phosphorus demand below about two parts per million resin phosphorus. And one of the most remarkable things about these, about these trees that, that, are, that are very strongly um, associated with low phosphorus is actually they're growing on average the fastest of all the trees in the area. So what I've plotted here is, is observed growth, so measured growth where we've repeatedly censused the plots uh, over the years. Um, the growth of every individual is a black point, and on the, on the x-axis is these phosphorus affinities, the strength of the associations of these species with phosphorus. And each blue point is a, is a species mean. And I realize there's a lot of scatter in here, but we're dealing with growth of individual trees in tropical forests, so there's an enormous amount of variation uh, within, a, within a species. But nevertheless, on average, the fastest growth in these plots is on the lowest phosphorus soils. So the fact that plants are investing in phosphorus acquisition from organic compounds is not constraining the growth of these trees. In fact, they're growing better on the lowest phosphorus trees, uh, the lowest phosphorus sites. Oh, I thought this morning about taking this slide out because it's a bit complicated. But in the end, I just I was too tired to do it, so I just left it in. But anyway, please bear with me for a moment while I explain this. So the question then is, is why? Is how these species are doing it on, on these low phosphorus soils? What's the mechanisms or what's the, how are they, how are they um, persisting in these low phosphorus sites and how are they growing so efficiently? And so what I'm showing here is some data which I think demonstrates some kind of trade-off between growth and, and investment in organic phosphorus acquisition. On the, if you look at the left-hand panel, um, this is a plot of growth rates, relative growth rates of trees grown in a, in a shade house uh, against their phosphorus uh, affinities, the phosphorus effect sizes. So if you look first just at the blue circles, I realize it's early in the morning to, to get into this level of detail, but if you look at the blue circles, this is the growth of trees. Each one of these points is an individual species. This is the growth of these species at low phosphorus. And what you can see, I hope, is that the blue circles show that the low phosphorus species grow fastest at low phosphorus. And that's the slope, this negative slope here. So the low phosphorus species growing faster than the high phosphorus species at low phosphorus. If we then give them phosphorus, if we grow those same species in a high phosphorus soil, this is the red circles. And so you can see then that the high phosphorus affinity species uh, then are doing much better than the low phosphorus affinity species at high phosphorus. On the right, I plotted the difference, the ability of these trees to change their growth in response to, to phosphorus addition. And what I hope you can see very clearly is that the low phosphorus species these ones that grow very happily, at, but only at low phosphorus, they can't upregulate their growth when we give them more phosphorus. They're kind of stuck in this low phosphorus uh, uh, growth rate mode, whereas the high phosphorus affinity species are much more flexible. They can really increase their growth rates at high phosphorus. Now we can do the same thing here in the bottom panel for phosphatase activity in the roots. And so it's exactly the same thing. The blue circles are every individual species it's phosphatase activity at low phosphorus. The red circles are the phosphatase activity at high phosphorus. And on the right panel, this is the difference, the ability of these species to change their investment in, in phosphatase in, in the roots. And what you can see is a negative relationship. So those low phosphorus species, not only can they not upregulate their growth, it seems like they can't um, change their root phosphatase, their investment in root phosphatase. So they're stuck in this they're stuck in this low phosphorus mode, they're not flexible at all. Whereas the, low, the high phosphorus species, the ones which can really upregulate their growth when we give them more phosphorus, uh, they can also downregulate their investment in phosphatase activity. So there's some kind of trade off going on perhaps between investment in growth, uh, in foliar, and maybe they're investing their nitrogen in leaves instead of in, in phosphatase. But there's this, some, some indication of a, of a trade off here. And in fact, I go even further and suggest that actually perhaps there's an influence on, on speciation. Uh, in these forests. So a link between organic phosphorus and the speciation of, of trees in, this, in these forests because many of the, many of the genera, uh, for example this one, Cecropia, which is a very common um, uh, uh, fast-growing, light-demanding um, group of species in Panama, there's about seven species. 
many of the genera distribute themselves very cleanly across the phosphorus gradient. And so here's some data for four species of Cecropia. Now they have very different phosphorus effect sizes. Cecropia in Cygnus only occurs at low phosphorus. Longipase and Peltata only occur at high phosphorus, and Obtusifolia doesn't really care, it goes anywhere. And when we look at their, the, this ability for these species to change their growth when we give them phosphorus, there's a very clear relationship uh, with phosphorus uh, affinity, suggesting that this, uh, the, the, the separation necessary to drive speciation in these plants perhaps comes uh, through the soil, uh, through, their, through the phosphorus and their ability of these plants to, to efficiently exploit organic phosphorus. Am I really over time, or did we start late? Can I have two more minutes? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so we, we mentioned uh, nitrogen fixation earlier in the week, if, for, for those who were here. So this is my contribution to this uh, debate. So I, I just want to go through three very quick examples of, of how this root phosphatase and organic phosphorus acquisition has, has in, uh, significance for some of these big issues that we're interested in. Um, this is a plot of, uh, of phosphatase activity in roots for many species in, in, uh, in the forest in Panama, separated into um, potential nitrogen-fixing species, legumes, and the Fabaceae, and uh, non-nitrogen-fixing non species. And what, ah, what you can see very clearly is that, sure, on average, uh, these potential nitrogen-fixing trees have much higher root phosphatase. And so this is linked to this idea that nitrogen fixers, which are very common in lowland tropical forests, about 10% of the stems can be... Uh, typically uh, legumes. Uh, one possibility is that they're investing all this extra nitrogen uh, into roots, into phosphatase enzymes, and therefore this gives them a, a phosphorus benefit. And it's very clear that, yes, the nitrogen fixers, uh, in Panama at least, have much higher root phosphatase activity than the non-fixers. Um, there are two problems, though. One is that uh, the majority of these potential nitrogen fixers aren't actually fixing nitrogen uh, in mature forests. They're just not, not doing it. They don't nodulate. They, uh, they can uh, if they're disturbed, but they, but they typically don't. And also we find that many other nitrogen-fixing species which are not in the legumes um, don't show this pattern at all, particularly in, uh, in Australia, in the Western Australian chrono sequences there. We've, there's many nitrogen-fixing species, and only the legumes, the acacias, uh, have higher phosphatase activity. Most uh, other species don't. And I put a picture here of the suicide tree, which is one of my favorite trees in Panama. It's a, it's a legume. It's a, <coughs> what we call in a super nitrogen fixer. It's fixing nitrogen, the, the the, the greatest rate of any of the legumes. And it's called the suicide tree because it has a very unusual life history. It grows, grows, grows uh, straight to the canopy, never reproduces, gets, becomes a big canopy tree. And then after a certain number of years, some trigger and met all the suicide trees, all the tachigali in the area, immediately fruit and flower and then die. The trees crash, leaves a big gap, and the seedlings then can... Uh, can then come up, so it's investing all its energy in growth and, and, and non in reproduction until, until one point. And so, super, super nitrogen fixer. Um, just very quickly, two other possible uh, um, significant um, issues about organic phosphorus in tropical forests. One is transpiration. We've heard a lot this week about how uh, plants and, and through their roots are acquiring phosphorus through phosphatase activity. I think one of the things that we are um, really not thinking about, but perhaps we should be, is that. Phosphorus acquisition by plants is, is often very strongly related to phosphorus, and this is an example of a whole series of different uh, um, plant, uh, plant species in, uh, that grow in lowland tropical forests. Their transpiration ratio, so the amount of water that they're moving through the, through the plant per, per kilogram of, of plant tissue, and the foliar phosphorus concentrations uh, on the, on the y-axis. And we find a very strong relationship across this really diverse range of, of plants, suggesting that this movement, mass movement of water, uh, through the roots is bringing organic phosphorus to the root surface. Uh, the plants, almost um, every species we've ever looked at has, has phosphatase activity on the roots. And so we're, we're very used to thinking of uh, mass flow and nutrient acquisition in terms of inorganic nutrients, but for organic phosphorus I think this is a, a, something we've really not, not thought about enough. And it's potentially, there are potential issues in the future with, with rising carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere because this reduces transpiration, so trees transpire less with higher CO2, so does this mean uh, there's going to be a reduction uh, in phosphorus acquisition? And just finally, um, there's this real strong possibility that actually plants are um, happily coexisting in these very diverse environments through, through partitioning, through resource partitioning for phosphorus. And this is a, a model that I proposed a few years ago where you have a series of co-occurring species, each investing in a different way. Uh, slightly more or slightly less in acquiring phosphorus in different forms from roots. And we have some evidence now um, that this is the, 
that this is happening in, in some montane forests in Panama. Um, I just have, Phil's looking at me like, uh, I can't tell if he's just hung over or uh, he wants me to stop talking, but I just have what, uh, a, little, a couple of reflective, reflective slides at Phil's request. Specifically, uh, Phil asked me to uh, consider this question. Uh, this was several months ago, and uh, after this meeting, it seems like the, the answer is obvious, but at the time, uh, the question was, you know, do we need a specific organic phosphorus meeting, or are we really just talking about phosphorus and, uh, you know, th it's moved on and things are, things are broader now? And so uh, this, this really got me thinking and uh, uh, took me back to when we first started the, uh, the organic phosphorus meeting in 2003, which was in Ascona. And this came out of, uh, uh, you know, frustration for me at the time as, a, as someone new working on organic phosphorus and Emmanuel Frossard. Uh, we, we used to have many conversations at meetings, Leo, Alan, others, all frustrated at the fact that ah, no one was talking about organic phosphorus. It was all about inorganic phosphorus. And there's a, probably a couple of good reasons for this. First of all, lots of the research historically has been in an agronomic context. We've been very focused on maximizing outputs of, of crops from, from inorganic fertilizer. Uh, most organisms take up phosphorus as inorganic phosphate, so naturally there's been a, a focus on inorganic forms. And of course, analytically, it's very challenging to, to measure organic phosphorus. And unlike the people working on nitrogen, who have a really nice um, set of tools, including a stable isotope that they can draw on uh, to look at ni nitrogen dynamics in the environment, we're fairly restricted uh, when we study organic phosphorus. It's conventionally been quite difficult uh, to, to do. But also being here this week and listening to Tony and, and, and talking with Tony Harrison also made me realize perhaps that I was just at, there at an awkward time and historically, perhaps, that in the 70s and 80s, Tony was happily working away on organic phosphorus. Dennis Cosgrove was doing lots of work in the, in the 50s and 60s. George Anderson. I mean, the many, many, uh, many great scientists were doing lots of interest in organic phosphorus work. And perhaps I was just there at the wrong time. It, you know, in the, in the 80s, there was this recognition that phosphorus was a, actually a pollutant. Uh, there was eutrophication of lakes and rivers. And, uh, and perhaps this was a, there was a, a, an increasing emphasis on on, on phosphorus um, as a pollutant, as inorganic phosphorus. So maybe there was just a, a historical note on this. And I had a look on the Ngram. This is the Google Ngram. Uh, so you can search for keywords in books since the 1900s. And so there's organic phosphorus and organic phosphate. And you can see there, actually, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, wow, there was lots of, lots of mention of organic phosphorus. Lots of people were working on it. And then there's been a decline. So maybe there's something in this, in this idea. And actually, if you look at, you can look at specific compounds. So I put phosphonate in there. There's a some people interested in phosphonate and inositol phosphates. Perhaps this was attributed to the, the rise of NMR in 1980. I don't know. But, but then when you compare phosphorus to organic phosphorus in general, this, I mean, maybe perhaps this is the point that there's a, this overwhelming interest in, in phosphorus in general and organic phosphorus and organic phosphate right there at the bottom. You can't really see them. And just for those who are pedants about the spelling of phosphorus, <laughs> actually you can see there's a persistent long-term misspelling of phosphorus in the, uh, in the literature. It's small, but it's there all the way, even since the 1900s. <laughs> Assuming they're not using it in the adjectival form, of course. And so uh, to answer, to get back to Phil's question, just very briefly to finish, do we still need an organic phosphorus meeting? And I think this, being here this week's made it really absolutely clear to me that yes, we do. Um, there's a massive interest now, an increasing interest in organic phosphorus in many in many spheres, the earth system modelers, the biochemists, the microbiologists, in ecology, and of course in sustainable agriculture. There's a recognition, and I think that's reflected in this meeting, uh, that there is interest in organic phosphorus and we need to be uh, thinking about it. And also, I find this meeting to be uh, a, real, uh, a real joy because there's such a multidisciplinary mix of, of scientists in a, in a single room in a relatively small meeting. It's pretty rare, I think, at least for me, to go to a meeting where I get to interact with agronomists, with freshwater biologists, uh, with uh, plant scientists, ecologists, soil scientists, all focused on, a, on, a, on an issue. And we're united really by, by two things, I think, and this has been the strength of this meeting over the years, is that we're united by uh, analytical methodology, we're united by common uh, analytical interests, and also we're united by mechanisms that I think transcend these, uh, uh, these disciplines. And also, this meeting is always in fantastic places. So it's been in Ascona, in Panama, the Lake District. Some of you might recognize that. I don't know where the next meeting is going to be. Um, but uh, this, is a, this is, of course, a great reason to have another meeting. Anyway, I realize I've overrun uh, a little bit. But thank you for your patience, especially after a heavy night last night. And uh, take any questions if there's time. <laughs>